Hi, and welcome to this exclusive first preview of Chess 2, the sequel. I am joined by Zach from Moonbeam Games. Hi, Zach. Hello. So, what are we doing today? Uh, we're going to play Chess 2, the sequel. It's a board game designed by David Serlin that really uh, takes some of the elements that you like most from chess, like uh, positional play and uh, adaptation, and minimizes some things that we're not so happy about, like memorization of the opening books or the end game. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna check out the online version of that today. All right, sounds exciting. Um, so as I understand it, this is a multiplayer game. Uh, yes, it is online multiplayer. All right, so uh, should uh, should we just continue to uh, play the game then? Because I'm very sure that people are eager to see what this is all about. Sure thing. Hit the button whenever you're ready. There we go. Sterling Games and Levine Games. This test we There we go. Nice. We're connected. All right, so yeah, we're playing a matchup of uh, two kings versus empowered right now. Yes. You're taking the empowered army. You you read up about this before the, the yes. game, right? Yes. Yes. Oh, right. You you know what to do. Uh, I guess so. Uh, but for our viewers, can you just uh, go go over the the rules very shortly? Absolutely. So, um, and you can go ahead and and make your move in this time. I'll just kind of explain while we go along. All right. Uh, is that. Uh, so one thing that's that's changed about Chess 2 is uh, you'll see this this blue midline in the game. That's uh, for the king to cross. If the king can cross this line, then you actually would win the game. That's called midline invasion. It's a, an alternative to checkmate. Um, oh yeah. The reason that that is there is uh, because end games in in chess are kind of a memorization thing, and the game is a bit anticlimactic uh, for some people if. Um, let me let me make my move here. You just uh, yes. advance this pawn. Um, so I'm going to advance a center pawn and then a king. Okay, so the the midline. Um, right, we were getting, we were talking about end games in chess. Yes. Um, they're they're memorized right now by professionals and um, even amateurs. That the game is anticlimactic because you just recognize a certain game and then you don't really even need to play it out. Yes. With midline invasion, um, the end of the game is is much more tense, right? As as progress toward crossing that midline is is made, the, the the end of the game is really the end of the game instead of something that's just seen um, a long time in advance. Um, also, it it eliminates draws from the game, um, almost. Yes. I, I've never seen a I've never seen it come up yet. Where in chess, um, right now among the top 20 players, about 60% of the games end in a draw. Wow. Um, and that's not very exciting. Uh, no, that's for, very for boring, actually. Right? <laughs> yeah, if, if a, a new sort of competitive game were invented today and it had that property, like people wouldn't really put up with it. But uh, because chess is kind of on a, a pedestal. Well, chess is really, really old, so uh, I guess it's on a pedestal because of the fact that it's been around for quite a while. Yeah, yeah, probably. And, and so it has like gathered a culture behind it, I guess. Um, so what we're going to be trying to do today is, is crossing the midline. Um, the army uh, that, that Matthias has, has chosen today is the uh, empowered army. And he gets uh, special abilities for, for playing this army. There are actually six different armies in the game, um, which allows us to have asymmetric matchups and, and different kinds of openings. What this does is makes the game more fresh and interesting from the first move. Instead of sort of uh, ha memorizing an opening book, um, that's impractical in Chess 2 because you don't know what the beginning of the game is going to be like. So um, you can't really memorize an opening book that's that's so much larger. Sort of like how it's dealt with in Chess 960 by, by Bobby Fischer. There's just more starting positions, that means less memorization. Oh, right, yeah. Um, right. Um, so another thing that that would add also is kind of a, a metagame um, where with um, games like Street Fighter or, or uh, StarCraft or Duel of Champions, a, a modern concept is having different heroes or different armies. And um, one... Um, will tend to be favored by certain people at given times. Um, maybe, 
maybe for a while people will think that empowered is a strong army and they'll they'll really be exploring that but then people will spend more effort in finding ways to counter empowered and then the game will sort of evolve over time as, oh, yeah sorry as in the way that we're, yeah yeah so people will get to learn the the game mechanics and then try to try out different things and then after a while something emerges that is that seems to be more efficient or seems to be more powerful than something else and then people will go towards that and sort of evolve their gameplay strategies yeah exactly yeah uh, but then as that gets popular then people are going to be trying to find a way to counter that yes and then if there's this uh, continuous cycle of um, so it's sort of self new self balancing well. game game design sort self of with the, with the asymmetry then. Yes, yes. What's uh, uh, the other... So, uh, <clears throat> I'll, I'll do my next move then. So, uh, for one thing, uh, for Empowered, uh, I don't think you've specified yet, is uh, what is special about Empowered? What's special about Empowered is um, that when your knights or bishops or rooks are adjacent to each other, then they can gain each other's movement properties. So right now, for example, um, your rook on h1 or or on A1, they both can move as, as a knight uh, yes. right now because it's adjacent to a knight. Yes. Um, but once it would, you can develop it right now, um, but once you do, it wouldn't have that power anymore because it's no longer adjacent to a knight. Yes. Uh, but to compensate for this extra advantage that you have, your queen can only move as a king. Right. So actually your queen is um, a very vulnerable pawn then, or a very vulnerable piece, sort of. Yeah, it's it's not it's not as strong. Yes. As, as a... um, so your queen doesn't get any attributes when she's adjacent to a knight or, or a rook or anything. No, she doesn't inherit. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I've made, I've made my move. So as you've seen, if you're if you're watching this, um, for our viewers out there, if, uh, my knight or my rook, I guess. Um, I'm not familiar with the English terms for chess since uh, it's not my native language. Um, just moved like a knight, uh, which is something that you don't see in normal chess, but it did so because it was adjacent to a knight, so that's, that's why it's standing over there. Right. I've chosen a different um, army today. I've chosen two kings, and um, that has a different kind of, of advantage and disadvantage. Um, so my advantage um, is that I can actually make two moves in my turn. Uh, one with uh, any normal piece, like I'll do so with my knight right now, and then also I can make a move with the king. Um, but I have two kings instead of having a queen. And in order to win, I would have to cross the midline with both kings. All but right, if yeah. Either one of them ends up in checkmate. Um, then you, you, you then lose. I will lose. Oh, okay, right. yeah. So it's sort of a counterbalance thing for the added advantage of being able to move twice. Yes. Yes. Uh, they're actually more powerful kings, so they're, they're warrior kings, and they have the ability to destroy any piece that's adjacent to them. All right, one, yeah. Also, that's called the whirlwind attack. All right, yeah. So um, I will do my next move then. Sure. Uh, I will go there to make sure that you don't cross that line. I would have to cross with both kings, though, to win. Yes, uh, but if you get one across, then that's something that I want to avoid, so... Okay, yeah, yeah. you don't want me in your area, definitely, yes. to be uh, exposing you to this whirlwind attack. Yes. Right. Um, okay, so I'm going to bring another uh, knight out into the game here, and just continue advancing my king, bring him into the game. All right. Um, one thing that I've seen is that the pieces look very nice, and I know that you're using the Unity engine. So, are you using any specific uh, technical stuff for the Unity, Unity engine? Uh, light mapping is really the the main contribution here. Um, well, it depends on what you're you're talking about by really nice, but I, probably the light mapping. Uh, yeah, mostly um, the material definition looks really good. So. Oh, the material definition is a uh, an extra shader that I programmed myself to add energy conservation to the Blin Fong shader. All oh, right. So, so that's really the, technical, but that what that really means is that like, for light reflected off of the surface, you can't have more or less light reflected than um, than is actually hitting the object, and that's not true with normal game shaders, and that's why they kind of look wonky. Yeah, so basically what you're doing is you're approaching physically based shading then. Yes, 
Yes. All right. So that's that's pretty nice to see in, in Unity, which uh, it's it's one of the first times that I've seen visit the base chaining actually approached in, in Unity in a non um, in, into in a non uh, native way where Unity themselves have put it in in, in a I don't know a, sort of a paper or something I guess. So yeah, I, there's I a, a lot of elf going into the lighting here. Yes. Oh yeah, you're you're kind of attacking my uh, yes. My king here. So, so now you're under chess, right? Check. Or check, yeah, sorry. <laughs> so normally I would uh, I would want to whirlwind attack here, but I, I would also lose my own knight if I did this. But I believe that this pawn is, is undefended, so I'm just going to come out here and take this one. Uh, by taking the pawn there, you saw that I, I gained a stone as well. This is uh, for a mechanic called dueling, which we can talk about when it comes up. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Uh, so, so I've also seen that if I sort of switch to perspective, it's the first time I've noticed this, is if I switch to perspective to move more towards the top of the board, then I actually get icons instead of uh, pawns, which is nice. Yeah. Um, if uh, you're a fan of the uh, two-dimensional pieces, then uh, we've got those in there for you. Yeah. Well, I, I wanted the the experience to be really pleasant um, and not have like options or settings like uh, chess engines that you might see on the, the PC. It just does what's kind of right. Like no one really wants to look at the 3D pieces from the top down. Yeah. So let's substitute and no and no one wants to look at 2D pieces with a 3D board. So let's just make it if you move the the camera up there and then it switches for you. Oh yeah, yeah. So that's it's sort of more gameplay clarity. Yeah. Right. We'll, uh, we'll not really worry about who wins or loses this game. This is just to check out uh, what the client looks like yes. and kind of talk about some of the technology, I guess, if we're interested in talking about lighting or something like that. But I'll, I'll narrate a bit. So what happened here is you, you put me in check again. Yes. Um, but to get out of that, I'm just gonna, going to apply the whirlwind attack uh, once again, uh, which, again, destroys everything around, around you. But king. because you put yeah. me in check, um, I did have to, to use my king first, which means that for my second turn, I also need to use a king right. again, because it's only my first move that I'm allowed to use the... Oh, yeah, other. yeah, yeah. So now you are advancing your other king, so I'm assuming that you want to uh, have the, the facet result for uh, putting your king in a position where you can actually win this game? Uh, yeah, I'm going for the, the midline invasion here. Yeah. Which is pretty tricky because uh, you have uh, empowered and empowered and controls a lot of squares at once. Yes, uh, I, I noticed since I'm, I'm using my uh, knight now, and I have pretty much every single option available to me. So that's a, that's a pretty <laughs> yeah, the knight is yeah pinched between the bishop and the yes up there. So now I put you in check again, I guess. You did. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm just going to. Uh, Lee here. Yes. And then advance my next king. All right. You should start to get a little worried here. I've actually I have uh, uh, the ability to march onto this uh, uh, d4 square with the second king in one move. So you need to protect that somehow. Um. Yes, I guess. Oh no. Uh, that will do. Yeah. That will do actually. Because I I need to move this king, so I can't actually move twice. Yes. Um, I'm just gonna go advanced here with this one. Okay. And then here. Uh, so now I can do. Uh, I should be able to do this. Oh no. And you win. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, so then. Oh, did I just lose the game? Checkmate. No, you won. Oh, I won. Yes. So we don't have the the you won implemented yet. Oh yeah, yeah. So now I now I won the game. Nice. Okay. <laughs>
the bishop. The bishop, yeah. So uh, rook, knight, and bishop get attributes from uh, each other as long as they're adjacent to each other. And with two kings, uh, you get instead of a queen, you get another king, and you have to get both of your kings um, on the other side of the field, which is also true for me. But I win if I put uh, any king of his into uh, checkmate. But the added advantage that he has is that he can do two moves uh, in a single turn, uh, which uh, one with a normal piece or a king and another with a king. So it's an added advantage, which is counterbalanced by the fact that he's lacking uh, the empowered attributes or a queen. So. Yep, that's that sums it up. So last time my mistake is to, to rush into the, the game, not defend my kings at all with uh, your very powerful uh, control over the board being able to checkmate me with these. So this time I'm going to keep those kings back and see uh, if he comes in to checkmate me or tries to, to go for a midline invasion of his own. Yes. Uh, so I begin since I'm white, I guess. Yep. There you go. All right. I'll come out here, and this time I'll just pass with my king. Right. So, uh, oh, so you can skip a move. So, so you can skip a move. Uh, you can choose not to play. With uh, with the two kings, you yes. can pass your king turn, yes. Okay, yeah, it's interesting. Okay. All right, so let's uh, go ahead and develop a bishop. Why not? So you move your bishop up, so it's almost at the midline, um, which means that you're playing pretty invasive now. So I should probably defend, right? Something. Sure. Um, so I, I guess yeah, we're not really worried about who who yeah, wins. Yeah, who's gonna this, win the uh, game? Yeah, we just want to show some gameplay. Um, yes, a little bit of com competitiveness is, is always nice. <laughs> Sometimes I like to bring out this uh, bishop here before I develop this second pawn so that it doesn't get trapped behind oh, yeah, uh, yeah. enemy lines there. Yeah, yeah. Um, don't have the importance of you being able to bring yours out like a knight or something. Yes. Uh, I'm trying to see what I should do here. It's, it's very interesting to have the attributes of a knight when you're playing with your bishop. So I can basically get out from behind my line of pawns with a knight or with a bishop while. Uh, so I can pretty much skip the line of pawns, which is interesting as a gameplay. Yeah, that has a lot of uh, implications too. Like, um, if we, if we were going to talk about that for a moment and, and talk about maybe if you were a strong chess player, how you might take some of your strategy into chess too. Um, with the, the knight move for the bishop. In chess, um, say that there's a lot of uh, enemy or, or your own bishops on a particular color, like maybe uh, maybe I'm putting a lot of my, um, sorry, my pawns all on, uh, on light squares, then your light-colored bishop would not be very useful because it would have a hard time going through those, yes. those pawns, right? It would be stuck. So you could actually change colors with your bishop here. If you recognize that and then want to develop it into a more useful position and increase its value. All right, yeah. By doing the knight move with the bishop, that is. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's actually a very, very interesting mechanic where you can you actually have to uh, sort of balance out how much you want to devaluate your 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 um, piece since in moving something out of range of an adjacent piece that gives you extra powers, you also take away those powers. So you have to actually think through what is going to happen after that since you are going to be losing your powers. Uh, so that's a very interesting tactical uh, ability to, uh, to consider when you're actually playing an advanced game. So that's... Of course you can get those powers uh, back by, yes. by linking up your pieces again. Yes. So that's again. Right now, I just added added, yeah, put your rook under threat of attack from this this bishop here. The empowered rook is worth considerably more than uh, my normal bishop, so you'd probably want to do something about that. Uh, so, uh, so I have to put the rook under the bishop. So over here, then. Sure. Uh, well, that's actually. 
uh, in line of fire. Oh, yeah. With my other bishop. But that'll give us a good opportunity to talk about dueling, uh, yes. which is the other um, interesting mechanic that was added by Sterling. Um, so in chess, um, you're not always playing the opponent. You're just playing um, the board normally. And in modern games, you have an opportunity sometimes to play mind games with your opponents to um, bluff them or to read their tendencies. Um, and if you're able to predict what they do, then you should be able to um, gain an advantage from that. Um, also, uh, one reason that, that dueling exists, and I'll explain what dueling is in a minute, but I'm just uh, setting up why dueling is interesting first. Um, another reason that dueling exists is to allow us to bid over what we think the values of given pieces are in a certain game. Right? Within chess, every piece has a value, like uh, in general, a bishop might be worth three pawns or something like that. Um, but it changes for each game that's played depending on the position. Like we talked about earlier, a, a bishop that might be stuck uh, because it's blocked by pawns. Um, that wouldn't have as high a value. Um, so chess 2 has a bidding system that allows us to express uh, how much we think a given piece is worth. And then um, if you're better at doing that valuation than your opponent, then you can gain an advantage. So let's do, let's do a duel and uh, see that how, that would, how that would work out. I'm yes. going to uh, attack your rook now. Yes. Um, and this rook is going to be captured. But on its way down, you have the opportunity to initiate a duel. Um, and and I if uh, you would uh, click on the duel button. Oh, there you go. So this is actually going to be um, available first on Ouya. You can see sort of the Ouya controls over here. But we're just playing on a PC right now so that we could record the yes the footage. Um, so normally you would hit A or whatever came up on your screen. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. It's duel. an O. Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so with a duel, um, the rook is going to be captured. But you have the opportunity also to capture my bishop. Yes. Um, and you will choose how many stones to bid, and I will choose how many stones to bid. And if you bid more stones than I do, um, up to a maximum of two, then you will capture the bishop. Yes. It's pretty simple. Uh, so I will bid two stones then? OK. Well, if I know what you're going to bid, then uh, clearly I, I would also bid two. <laughs> it's, a, it's a double blind. Um, Yes. System. I'm not supposed to know. Oh, yeah, yeah. So that's interesting. Um, Just for demonstration, I'll, I'll bid one. Yes. And, um, so you bid two, I bid one. And because I didn't bid as much as you, then I, I lost. Um, and I lost my bid. All right, so what would happen if we actually bid the same amount of stones? If we bid the same amount of stones, then the bishop stays. All right, so then I lose my rook and the bishop stays. That's interesting. The, okay. the, the rook is, is going to be captured regardless of the outcome. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. OK, so there is no possible outcome where my rook wouldn't be captured. Correct. OK, yeah. Just like in real chess, I guess. All right, so I'm playing a really defensive yes. line. Yeah, you're you're really hiding your your kings after like behind a sort of wall of, of pawns there. So so uh, I'm gonna have to really examine what I should do here. Um, so I'm betting that I want to do something with my empowered pieces here, but uh, it, the options at this moment seem to be uh, somewhat limited since uh, I have sort of walled in myself behind a wall of pawns. Uh, sure. Let me give you a, a tip. In, uh, in normal chess, actually this is something I li really like about chess too, is that um, it's going to test how well you understand sort of the, the principles of chess instead of just following them blindly. In chess, you would want to develop your knights first, yes. uh, mainly because they can develop first. But in chess too empowered, I think... Um, that's wrong because if you develop your knights first, you will lose the opportunity to develop um, some of your other pieces in the game. So, for example, right now, um, that rook um, on a1, if you were to uh, bring out your knight, then you'd lose the opportunity to bring out the rook as well. Yes. So I would I would take your your knights out last and try to um, imagine a position in the future 
where these are all, all developed but are touching each other. And yes. If I do to hit one of those positions. So then I will do this. Uh, because the next move, then I can put my knight next to the, the rook, and then everything will be empowered again. Yes. Yes. That would be great for you. Um, so I'm going to bring out another piece here, and then pass. So now I have an empowered rook again. So that's nice. Yeah. Going to uh, keep control of the center here. Still uh, another important um, concept from chess. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's indeed a very well understood concept for trying to keep control of the game. So what, yeah. now what I've done is I put myself into a position where your pawn can capture mine, but if you do that, then my pawn can capture yours the turn after. So, right, so you're challenging my control of the center here. Yes. And trying to disrupt that. That's a, a good tactic, of course. Um, I see that... Uh, where your king is, and that it's it's possible developments toward making progress to the midline are at um, f3 and d3. So maybe if I um, decline your offer here and then just advance that, then so that puts I me can... in a position where I have to go around with my king because I can't move uh, I can't move myself into a piece into a position where I would be put under check. So right, yeah. This also. Um, limits the development of your g1 knight, I think, to have this, this pawn here. It can't develop toward the center. Yes, it, it, it does, yeah. Um, it mostly hinders my, my, my possibilities in, in where I would move my empowered pieces. Um, since I can now not really prevent your king from passing over the line. Uh, it's only one, though. Uh, yes. I have to make two. Yes, it's true. Um, what I could do, however, is I could move my empowered bishop over here. Uh, and in doing that... You actually can uh, prevent me, but continue. Uh, yes. So I can move my uh, knight over there, which disempowers my, uh, my bishop and my knight. But if I somehow get my bishop back over there that I can empower my knight to stop your king from crossing the line. Though so I'm pretty sure that I won't be able to do that before you actually cross the line. So, Right. I think a, a stronger move here uh, would have been to take the, um, the bishop's move with this knight from g1 to g2. Yes. Um, and then you could actually defend that, that square where I was going and it would have remained empowered. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, now we're, yeah, that's right. Um, right now, actually, I have the opportunity to come from f5 to g4 and perform a whirlwind attack, uh, destroying both pawns there and the Ooh, wow. uh, knight. I won't do that. <laughs> it's a friendly game. <laughs> it's actually a pretty empowered move there. <laughs> Instead, I'm just going to to make a trade here. I think. Um, that with the empowered army, because your um, what well one of the principles would be that because you gain your power from linking up, that if I can trade pieces that would otherwise be similar in value, that reduces your ability to link up the pieces. Um, so I can come here and trade this bishop for this knight here, and while that would normally be like an even trade in chess, or actually a bad trade for me because I think the the position of the bishop was a little better than. And knight here, it's it's a good trade um, because I am reducing your abilities to link up and reducing the. Yes, so now you are disempowering my knight, pretty much. Yeah. So now I'm going to. I think I'm going to decline the duel since you can offer two stones, where I can only offer one stone, which means that you're always going to be sure that you win the duel. Um, I would have the opportunity to win the duel, right? Um, yeah. So. What you could do then is bluff in that situation and just bid zero and then make me waste a stone. Um, oh, right. And that's where the, the mind game comes from. Oh, so you can what actually. You doing? Yeah, so you can actually say, hey, I, I don't really I actually need this piece, but I do want you to have less stones than me, so uh, I'm going to bluff zero, and then the chances are that you will bl uh, bid two stones which would make you lose both of your stones, uh, which I, I would still lose my piece, which I would anyway, 
but since I have no chance of winning the duel, since you know how many stones I have, uh, I can make you lose both stones and then win the next duel. Right, something like that. Yes. Okay, I'm gonna advance forward with this, this other king. So now, of course, I'm gonna take your bishop here. Uh, since I, I don't really need that uh, pawn, I don't really care whether or not it's captured. Um, this is just a pawn. I'm going to go ahead and duel it, though. Yeah. For fun. Yes. So let's see what happens. Do you think I'm going to attempt to catch it? Uh, you didn't. So you bid zero. Yes. Uh, but then I got it and, and got my stone back, actually, because I get one for capturing the pawn. Oh, right. Yeah. So, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, so I should, I had better start capturing pawns then since I'm down on stones and I really need some, something to defend myself with. Uh, so I'm going to, this is actually... <laughs> it's my move actually. Yes, 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 uh, yes. But I will uh, come up here. Oh, wow, that's interesting. Yeah. Uh, so, for so last game. Yeah, so now I'm actually under threat of actually losing the game in the next move, since... Yes. Uh, that's interesting. Um, I'm wondering whether I can defend myself against this in any way. Uh, uh, I can see ways to delay it. Yeah, but actually prevent losing the game is pretty much impossible at this point, I guess. Uh, I so I can do this, and that means you are under check, uh, and you cannot take my rook since that will put you under check again. Uh, so I have not. There is the whirlwind attack. There is the whirlwind attack, right? That I didn't think about, right? And there is also the knight that you have standing back there, which I did yep. not notice before I put my rook there. So. <laughs> okay, we could we could de delay it, uh, but not finish the game. And that, that, yeah, it doesn't matter who wins. We're just. Uh, well, if we, if we finish the game now, then we can play another game and then sort of take a different approach oh, all right. towards... Yeah, uh, let's keep going as long as you want. Yes. Um, so I'm going to display the whirlwind attack here. Take all those pieces. So that's a really, run. really powerful attack there. Yes. Uh, you need to keep it in mind at all times. Yes. Uh, so that's very interesting since... Uh, so the added vulnerability is really counterbalanced by the fact that your kings are, are incredibly powerful as soon as they cross the line. Uh, yeah, there's there are checks and balances to each of the armies. There aren't any armies that are stronger than others, and actually they're all balanced against the classic army as well, which is the only army that has a, a proper queen and, and brings a lot of power to the game. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's the vulnerability that like if you forked me, for example, with your knight, um, then that would basically be game over uh, because unless I can capture the knight or something. But, um, yeah, yeah. Because I can't end either of my turn in check, so any fork or um, pin uh, uh, or anything is extremely dangerous for you. All right, yeah, so let's start up another game. Yes. So basically, uh, that was a very fun game last game. So um, one of the things that I noticed, though, is that it's complicated to sort of memorize or sort of anticipate what's going to happen, since one of the most important things about chess, as far as I can gather it, is sort of trying to anticipate the opponent's move based on what you just did. So, professional game uh, game player um, chess players can probably anticipate any move based on what they just did, since there are only a certain number of moves. And if you anticipate, if you memorize all of them, you can anticipate any move. Uh, but since chess two offers so many more different options in in anticipating your opponent's move, it becomes a lot more interesting to try and see what can happen or, or will happen. Uh, and I, I personally think it's something that people will really have to get used to, but it's, it adds a lot of excitement to a game that is, is otherwise sort of a cliche of, of not really boring, but not as, really as exciting as, uh, say, a first-person shooter or anything. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting to see the added mechanics of, of trying to bring speed to a game that is inherently slow. Yeah, one thing that's not very well known about um, anticipating the opponent's moves is that grandmasters actually don't think very far ahead most of the time in the games. They'll only see about three moves ahead. People think that they're very strong because they can see all 10, 15 moves in the future. That's not really true. Uh, they're usually 
um, trying to improve their 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 position um, by noticing imbalances in the game, like uh, material for tempo or um, space advantage, or noticing those kinds of imbalances, and then positioning each piece on a square given the context that would give them the highest value for that that piece that's how how chess is played at a at a high level yes um so here that i think that um is is even more interesting because with the added asymmetry at the beginning of the game it it brings players to the right uh frame of mind at the beginning right now i will try and think of ways to um to diffuse your empowered ability or to um but, and maximize my whirlwind kind of thing. And that's actually like how grandmasters think about real chess. But the learning curve to get to that part is is really difficult, where that game brings this element, uh, or sorry, chess 2 brings that element right into like the first games and, and uh, makes that very accessible. Yeah, yeah. So what I'm, I'm going to be trying to do this game, since I now have sort of better inkling of what I need to do to defend myself, I'm going to try and start off with uh, building a strong defense against you bringing your kings over here, since obviously the whirlwind attack is something that is very powerful, so I need to defend myself against it. Uh, so my main objective in this game is going to be try to prevent you coming over the line with a single king. Very good. I like that idea. Um, I will continue with my king anyway. Yes. And try and uh, not let you do that. So let's uh, grab control of the center here and keep that king going forward. Let's see how well you can push him back. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to try to prevent you doing that by making sure that whatever move you you play, you will always come under chess if you cross the line, so... Right, so now you just uh, prevented me from taking uh, the C5 yes. uh, square, which is a good idea. And you're in a, a good position here to link up um, your pieces again. If you're, that other knight comes out, then that's like a powerhouse of, yes. of controlled squares. So I'm going to try and um, disrupt that, um, because I don't want you to control mm -hmm. all those squares. I'm going to take my pawn here and uh, make, uh, well, disincentivize. Oh, that, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So basically what you're doing point. now is you make sure that if I put my knight there, I'm going to lose my knight against a pawn, which is something that I never want to do since right. Especially it's a very valuable pawn, pawn, piece. Power. Yeah, yeah. Um, what I can do, however, is I can... Hmm, this is interesting. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you pretty much blocked me on both ends there. <laughs> uh, what I can do is I can do this, which still blocks your king from uh, going a certain direction, which it already did, but now you can't move uh, forward, I guess. Maybe it's not as smart a move as I thought it would be, but... We'll see how it is. Actually, I, I can take that rook this turn if I so choose because I have the two moves. I could oh, come. Oh, uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that, that's, that's one factor that I forgot about. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll let this one slide. Yes. Uh, since we're just, we're just playing a friendly game and uh, you're getting familiar with it for the first time here. So instead, I'll just uh, develop here and uh, slowly. Actually, I'll, I'll, keep, I'll keep my kings back and pass for this king. Turn. Yeah, it's definitely one of the things that I, I really need to get used to is your king not only being able to do the whirlwind attack, but also being able to um, come across, uh, come uh, do two moves at once, which is something you don't really consider in putting a rook in the position that I did, since I thought that in, in a normal game of chess you would not be able to do anything about that, since your king would not be able to put himself under chess. Uh, because you can only move once, but since you can move twice, you can actually take the rook without putting yourself under chess at the end of the turn. Um, actually, I'm in this game. I'm not allowed to end either check, turn. Yeah. Check. Yeah. Um, but because the c6 squared wasn't protected, yes. I could move through there. 
Um, oh, and never come under yeah. check at any point. Yes. Um, so since you just moved back, I'm, I'm going to make this a very friendly game, and I'm just going to make a little null move here. <laughs> uh, so what I'm going to try to do now is I am going to try and put your king under... Hmm, I can't put it under check. Can I? Hmm. Yeah, I can put your king under check, but you can move away in one turn, but that gives me a turn to do something else. So I'm going to go ahead and hmm, yeah, do that. Since you can't move directly in the direction of my rook uh, or of my bishop, you can never put yourself, since you can never put yourself under che check, that means you can't take my bishop in one turn, right? That is correct. I cannot. Okay. Uh, so let's see how you deal with the threat of um, the whirlwind attack. Yes. Yeah. Or threat against the uh, rook here. Yeah, so now in uh, placing my bishop in a different tile, I've actually enabled you to come across the line and, and make sure that you have a whirlwind attack there, so that's pretty bad. Um, so what I'm going to try to do here is I'm going to try to move my rook in a safer position that is somewhat off from the whirlwind attack, since if you execute a whirlwind attack now, uh, the only thing that you will get is my rook, since I, and I don't want to put that into a position to be taken, so I will move my rook away. Yeah. It's actually still uh, under threat of the whirlwind attack because of the two moves. Oh, yeah, but, but uh, you can't okay. move yourself under check. Uh, right. So you can't move forward without putting yourself under check, so I'm pretty safe now. Uh, well, the, the d4 square, yes. though, is not protected. I didn't see that um, one. <laughs> but in, to do so, I would have to kill two of my own um, pawns. Yes. And that would uh, leave me very vulnerable uh, to a move like... Um, uh, yeah, cross-field check. Cross-field check. I'm not sure what that means. Oh, uh, well, I can put your, your king under check from way behind my, my line of pawns if I put a single uh, rook in, a, in the right position. Oh, sure. Um, so, let's see. What am I going to do here? Let's, um, let's develop another piece. And uh, start advancing my second king. That's interesting. Uh, so, I'm going to try to empower this rook here. And put it out of the threat of the whirlwind attack. So now it's your turn, and I'm very curious to see what you're going to do. Right. It's under the threat of the being captured by the pawn. Yes. Um, but again, I'll, I'll let that slide. Well, you can you can take it, and then I'll take it back, and then I'll have... Ah, uh, and then you'd be putting me in check that way. Okay. Let's, yes. Let's continue with your plan, then, see how that works. You have the opportunity to duel. Uh, so we both have three stones. Let's see how this plays out. Uh, so my... Rook is gone either way. Yes, he is. Okay. Um, I think uh, that you want to move where the pawn is anyway, so I'm not going to value this, this pawn very much because I think it's going to be captured. You wanted to put me in check like that, so I'm just going to bid zero. See what happens. You bid two. It paid off for me, I guess. Yes, because I, I lost a single stone. Yeah. Uh, so that's interesting. Uh, so now I can do is I can put that under check. Yeah, it's still your turn since you have two moves. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah, I'm going to pass. Oh, there we go. Uh, so now in it's interesting, right? That's very interesting. Uh. I'm trying to see if there is any way that you can get close enough to me to execute your whirlwind attack before putting yourself under check. check. Um, I'm not. I'm thinking it isn't. Well, uh, a move, for example, like um, g1 to f3 yes. would actually um, protect the the d3 and d4 squares so that I couldn't go through them. 
because um, or or that also um, protects those squares. Does so it just I actually not... put you under check? That did put me in check. Yes. If you had a, if you had advanced the knight, it would not have put me under check. But this does, so that's the trade off there. Uh, so the only only option I have, I can uh, block it by advancing a pawn here, or I can retreat. Um, <clears throat> so I think I'm going to add uh, the protection to my king by advancing this pawn. Right. So uh, do you still uh, have the whirlwind attack if you move back uh, to your side of the field with that king? I have the whirlwind attack anywhere on the board. Oh, yeah. Uh, but obviously if I'm back in, in my area, then my own pieces would be under threat as well. Yeah, so that's something that you would need to consider in uh, considering when you want to execute that whirlwind attack or not. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to try and put you under check again. There you go. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's very good. Yes. So here I actually I don't even have the opportunity to whirlwind because if I did. I'd kill my pawn on d4, and that would expose me to check from your bishop on f4. Yes, that's, that's what I was counting on. Right. Um, and I, most of my retreat squares are actually um, taken. I can't go to b5 because of your bishop, and I, I can't go to d5 because of your rook. Um, so I have only one move here, and that's never a good place to be, is going to b4. Since I have a, a second move, move with my king, I'm just going to keep retreating that guy back. Yes. So now I forced you back onto your side of the field, uh, which puts me in a somewhat safer position since you have to put both kings over the line. Yes. Yes. Uh, it also means that uh, you've gained a tempo advantage because if I'm spending moves going forward too early in the game, if I'm trying to invade that midline too early and you push me back, a move forward with my king and a move backward with my king aren't yes. actually accomplishing anything. Yes. So you've gained a tempo advantage there. So now I feel like it's a little bit more uh, like a matchup in, in the game balance since I've sort of figured out the, the mechanics by now. So it's nice to see that it actually does balance itself out after both players actually figure out the mechanics. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And it doesn't actually take very long to... Um, start doing interesting things. I've noticed that you've improved a lot in your game after just a few here. Well, I've played some chess in real life, and I notice it does help if you actually know the mechanics of the, the basic game, so... Definitely does. Alright, so I, I just figured uh, advance, why not advance uh, or develop a knight here, and then uh, and pass. Yeah. Uh... Develop to so what I'm trying to do is I'm, I'm going to see what happens if I do this, uh, since uh -huh. it's a pawn for a pawn. Yep. And I don't like where that uh, where that pawn is in the center, sort of challenging my bishop. I didn't really want to spend my, my next move to um, retreat the bishop, so I'm going to go ahead and duel for this pawn. Right. So I've made some secret bid. You can try and figure out what it is, what you think I'm going to do, what the value of this move is and then, and then pick your own. Alright, so you bid zero. You knew what I was going to do because of what I said. Yes. And then you, you, you profited. You now have the stone advantage. Yes. Uh, so that's that's again where that, that valuation comes into play is because um, you didn't want to win this particular duel. You didn't think maybe that that one was very important. That's going to give you an advantage later on in the game. Yes. Um, so, But what I did though what I paid for by um, capturing that pawn was the ability now to uh, center this rook here. And put my king under uh, check. Right, and I like the, having the mobility of this, this long file. Yes. So I'm going to do that, um, and then pass with my king move. Uh, so basically now you've actually put me under a big threat since uh, the only thing that I can do is block my king from being under check. Uh, so you, now can, I, you have or retreat square as well, but you can also block. Yep. Oh, yeah, I do. Uh, that's true. Um, so if I... Yeah, so if, but if I, I choose a retreat square that actually sacrifices one of my moves to, for you to actually move forward again with your king. Um, 
But I will do this with the with retreat square and then see how this plays out. Right, another option for you might have been to uh, move in your uh, your queen because she's not actually very valuable. So she. Oh yeah, that's true. Although if she gets yeah. into the center, she would make a good trade for you. Yeah. Um, but she takes some time, so that that would have been one option. All right, I need to disrupt this uh, very powerful combo um, where you have that. Uh, Bishop and Rook here kind of controlling a lot of center squares is keeping my second king from developing. I need to think about something um, to break that up. So um, I don't have any immediate way to threat threaten those. Actually, I could uh, move this uh, knight here into the center. That would threaten them. Um, it is protected by my king as far as I can tell. So I'm just going to try and break you up that way. Uh, so what I'm, oh. yeah, so, so now I'm actually in the position where I have to sort of make sure that that combo is there broken since uh, my bishop will now be disempowered if I actually allow it to be taken. So my option here would be to actually take the knight with my rook since it is empowered from, by the bishop that is next to it. And as far as I can tell, it doesn't really have any disadvantages to it since the most you can do there is you can take it back with your king. Um, so Valuation-wise, I think I, I would uh, value a, an empowered rook over a, a knight. Yes. So I, yes. I think that true. trading that would be a bit of a weak trade. Yes, that's true. Um, Actually, this is actually one of the one of the ways that you can actually sort of pace the game is have people really really think what they're going to do the next turn. So um, I do I do value my empowered bishop, so I really want to keep that piece there. Uh, you have a lot of squares open to you. Uh, yes. Move as a as a rook or a bishop right now. Yeah, that's true. Um, so. I'm going to try to examine what my available moves here are. Um, and I am going to do something that might be interesting here is... Ooh, yeah, this is interesting. Um, I can do this. It's actually... Oops. Wait. Uh, yeah. Ah. Okay, so you... Uh, so I put started. here... Yeah. Hit me there. Um, I can capture back if I decided to do a whirlwind, but uh, I would end up losing one of my own pieces for that as well. Yes, that's what I'm counting on. So um, I'm sort of betting that you won't put your pieces under threat of that whirlwind attack and then end up losing a lot more pieces than you, you actually bet for. So. Right. I'm going to decline this duel. Um, so you got a, a stone there. You have a big stone advantage now. Yes. Um, I do still like the idea of trading uh, my my knight uh, for a bishop, so I am going to go ahead with that whirlwind attack. Oh, I can't without taking... Sorry, my bad. I was thinking of moving to the, the e6 square and then doing whirlwind attack from there, but I can't because it's obviously protected by your bishop. So if I were to take it, I'd have to lose my rook, and that's not a great trade. So I'm just going to um, have to advance here. Yes, so that, that's actually the move that I was counting on, uh, since now you were actually forced to move your king into a position where you might not want it to be. So that's, some, that's one of the things that I was hoping you would do, since now I can actually uh, wait for your second turn and then see what's going to happen. All right. Or I'm seeing that if I stay here, um, that would be bad news for me. Maybe I'll just go farther into the center, and now I've lost some of my my king protection. Yes. Be rough. Uh, so, well, this is this is actually a very threatening position for me since now you are under a position where if I defend this this position, you can just move forward with your king and do a whirlwind attack, which would have me lose my uh, rook and my bishop. So that's. A pretty expensive move there. 
Um, but I can't actually move to that square because oh, it's, it's true, protected. Yeah. yeah, it's protected. So, um, so my only whirlwind option would be for d4, and I'd lose two pieces to your one. Yes, which is not. But a you good do trade. have to watch out for the possibility of midline invasion now. Yes. Oh yeah, since but now I have one protected square, so I know you can't put your piece there. Uh, so the only thing that I have to do is make sure that you cannot cross the line with your other king and then put it under th put me on the defense again in attempting to prevent your other king from crossing that line. Uh, so this is a, actually an interesting development here. Uh, what, what I noticed that is blocking me right now is your knight that's standing next to your king is preventing me from putting your other king under threat of possible check. So, Right, actually that knight is uh, very useful to me right now. The one that um, is protecting the c3 square, because if you actually moved your um, knight there and if it weren't for that knight, um, you would be forking my kings with that knight. Yes. Yeah, their bishop, and that would be game over. Yes. So, yeah, that, that's actually a very threatening move there. So I, I, what I need to do now is, if I understand correctly, I need to get rid of that, uh, that knight there. Uh, sure, if you wanted to, to continue with, with that idea. There are really a lot of uh, a lot of opportunities for yeah for you here. But it is this position is a little tricky and it's hard to see exactly uh, which one to pursue. Yeah, it's true. You've also got a free piece to take at the <laughs> if you just wanted to take that rook. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm considering that. Uh, yeah, I'm considering taking the rook, and I, I think I'm going to since it's the best available option to me since. Uh, the direct threat of, of king invasion is not is not happening right now since you don't really have an option to uh, cross the line with both kings. So, um, right, actually, I do. But since I misled you, I said you have a free piece. On accident there. Oh, um, you deceived me. <laughs> I, I won't do it. Um, but well, let's let's go ahead and duel then. Um, I think it's better uh, to duel than to be dueled and to put the opponent's pieces at risk rather than your own. Yes. So I'm just going to go ahead and do that. Uh, so now I am... Hmm. So now you bet... Yes. Yep. So because that's a highly valuable piece. Yeah. So one thing that's unfortunate now about the uh, the stone advantage that you gained earlier by sacrificing that that pawn and whatnot is that um, you're going to win any duels that happen in the future by virtue of the fact that I cannot um, offer any stones. Yeah. I cannot offer any stones, so you just offer one and you you take it immediately. Yeah. So so that's pretty much a guarantee for me to to win any duel in the future. Um, pretty much indefinitely, so it's interesting for me to see. Uh, as long as you don't take any other pieces, then pre I, I have a big advantage in dueling. Right, I can uh, I can gain some stones back by taking a pawn. Um, but there are there don't look like any easy opportunities for that right now. So I should uh, uh, develop this here. And then uh, I think that my kings, although it's nice to, to be able to do this midline thing uh, there, in a lot of danger, so I'm just going to go back a little bit. Right, so basically what you've done now is you, you put your bishop uh, so it puts my rook under threat. Uh, pretty much what that does is that gives you the opportunity to, in moving back your king, you've actually made sure that I have to protect my rook here, which opens up options for you to move your king across the line anyway. That's true. Yeah. So I'm going to protect my line of defense here. Uh, that may not have been a smart move since now you can take my queen unchallenged. Right, but the queen is not actually playing a major role in this game right now. Yeah, it's true. But it, it's still a piece. And that would, it's still a piece. Yeah, as well. it, it would put your bishop behind the line of pawns there. So that's actually an interesting disadvantage that I have there. Okay, so yep, you of course dueled there, took that yes. that bishop, and 
now I'm going to um, I have my my king move, so I'm just going to knock your bishop around something. Uh, so now the option that is available to me is either I lose my bishop or I take something down with me. Uh, so I'm going to do this. All right, then. I, yeah, I'm going to come at you with my pawn, leading to a, a doubled pawn here. Yes. Uh, not the greatest, but. Uh, so the only thing that I can do, uh, and obviously will do, is I will duel and take that pawn with me. Right. You got your, your stone back for free. Yes. Uh, I did lose a bishop there, but I, that bishop took a rook and a knight, so that's pretty valuable bishop there that I sort of sacrifice for being able to get that advantage. Um, yes. There we go. Ah, very good. Very good move indeed. Uh, it's not uh, It's not very good for me to do a whirlwind attack, which would be my only way of taking that pawn. Um, I'd like to stay ac across the midline at this point, I think. I think some of the, the threats there have been diffused. Um, so I'm going to stay on this side of the board. All right. And then start to advance the second king over there. Um, I'm keeping my, my attack on the right now. I think I have a lot more pieces over there, so that's probably a safer place for my king to advance. Yep. Uh, so I am hoping that this will be an interesting move. Uh, wait. Oh, yeah, that's true. Um, if you do that... Right, so the only thing I can do at this point with that bishop is force your king back over the line. It is indeed forcing my king back over the line. What will you do now? Yeah, I'm trying to consider what is the best option available to me. Uh, for now, I would very much like the advantage of being able to have an empowered rook with a bishop next to it. But since I lost my my other bishop, uh, I am not in a position to move it back across the field to empower that rook over there. But that rook is in a pretty good position to defend my part of the, the battlefield line, so I'm going to do that, and that actually prevents you from moving your kings across the line until that rook is actually out of there. Right, yeah, that's definitely a, a good move. So my only option, if I wanted to continue with my uh, midline idea, would be uh, to displace that rook. Yes. So I might as well continue with that idea and come here, and then... Uh, advance this king. So obviously my next move is going to be to again protect this middle line in trying to protect the rook at the same time. Okay. Um, now this is a bit tricky. Uh, I could do this, which would give you the opportunity to uh, take a pawn there, but you would uh, bring your Rook out of the game for a moment, um, in doing so. Yes. I'm gonna do that. Um. Then I don't have any good uh, places for my kingdom to develop right now, so I'm going to pass with that. Uh. So now what I can do is. Hmm. It's actually very interesting. So interesting to see is that either way. Whether my rook is there or not, you cannot move your kings across that line since... Uh, not on this turn. No. Yes. Uh, more so because you cannot move across that line uh, without putting yourself under check. Uh, because there's the pawn and the bishop there, so that's an interesting advantage that I have. Um, so what I'm going to do is, obviously I'm not going to lose my rook there, so I'm going to take that pawn. Yep, that will do well. Um... What I'm going to do is try and prevent, now that you've, uh, you've made this exchange, prevent you from from taking control of that line again just by putting this pawn here. If I can then defend the pawn, say with a move from um, uh, d5 uh, to, to f6 with my knight, 
then it will be difficult for you to bring that uh, rook back into the game. Right. Um, so now I can... So now your king is across the line of the battlefield there. Uh, so the other thing that I can do really is I can put that king under potential threat of being... You no. Know, that's actually in an interesting development there. Um, that king isn't going anywhere though, since the only thing that you would be able to do is put yourself under check if you move anywhere but where you are right now, so... Um, or pretty much anywhere, you can move to the right, of course. Um, I should put the uh, the clocks a bit higher for this game. You've only got two, two minutes, minutes and thirty seconds. Yeah, I, I noticed. I noticed. <laughs> um, Doing all the narration. So now, uh, damn, this is actually <laughs> this is actually complicated. Um, so one move that looks tempting right now would be to bring your um, my knight out. Your knight out, or I, well, I was thinking the. Um, the, the, the B pawn, if it came forward, it would be a uh, check, but the I would immediately sacrifice both my... Oh, no, I can't. Sorry, I was thinking I would, I would whirlwind to sacrifice both my... Um, both your bishop and your and knight. Bishop, yeah. um, for those two pawns, then allowing me to cross the midline, but I can't because that would actually put my king in check from the, the rook, which I just placed there. <laughs> <laughs> uh... Oh, it would? Oh, yeah, it does. It does. So you, you cannot, in fact, defend your king there, so you have to... I saw you you did this. Yes. I, I did not actually see that option, so thank you for pointing that out. <laughs> okay, so now I'm retreating. Yes. Uh, and then I'll go ahead and pass. Uh, so now I will sort of press the advantage here and yeah. sort of... Right, and there's nothing I can do here to move forward. I've got to move back. Yes. That's uh, very unfortunate because uh, my bishop is under not very threat. Happy. Yes, but now I can move this king back. Uh, so now, obviously, I can take that bishop without being challenged for a duel, and your king is again under check. Uh, right. Yeah. Uh, again, I have trouble. I can't do the midline because uh, I mean I can't do a whirlwind because then I'd come under. Threat here, so I'm gonna take this pawn. Um, and there's still no open square for me. So I'm gonna pass again, keeping that pressure on. Yes. Uh, so now trying to move fast here. I'm gonna try to take that pawn away because it's, a, it's sort of in my way of putting your king in a position where it can't move anywhere. Um, so I'm gonna try and challenge. Uh, some of those those pieces that have been giving me trouble back there, by by putting this uh, rook into play on that file. All right. Uh, so my wait. You won. I did. Somehow. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I think I put your king under checkmate since the the I put my knight uh, on a3, which uh, basically puts you under checkmate since you you cannot move anywhere without putting your king under check from the pawn, and it was under check from the knight, so. Well done, sir. Yay, I won uh, <laughs> in the last minute or so. So, uh, wow, that's actually that's a pretty well matched up game, I have to say. Like, the, the addition of the, the extra powers that you get from the empowered pieces is a very interesting mechanic once you actually figure it out, so. Wow, yeah. Um, yeah each see, of the, yeah. the armies is, is interesting to explore. There are six of them in the, in the final game. We're only looking at two of them today. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of uh, opportunity to see how your playstyle might match up with this with this game. Are you someone who likes uh, to advance very quickly, maybe with the two kings? Are you someone that likes to uh, suffocate the opponent and put control over the board with empower? Then many many other options that would fit different play styles for, for different armies. Yes. Uh, one thing that I've noticed is that certain armies actually prefer certain play styles in the sense that your two kings play, uh, army actually prefers a very aggressive play style in trying to get that king uh, away from 
your side as fast as possible in order to execute a successful whirlwind attack that can, that can actually take out a lot of pieces on my side. Um, right, there's a high risk, high reward in exposing yes. the king. It hasn't, it hasn't paid off for me very well in these, in these games. Every time that I bring the, the kings forward, I lose. Well, should not be surprising. <laughs> well, well, for one thing, I, I, I do feel like the empowered uh, setup here is very powerful to counter uh, the two kings' playstyle, since I can very quickly put your kings in a position where there are not a lot of things that I can do. So, um, in empowering a rook with the extra option of bishop's moves, uh, I can actually prevent you from moving pretty much anywhere. So it actually seems like a very well-balanced setup overall, since um, there is always something that you can do to counter the added advantage of the other army's um, attributes. So that's actually very interesting to see. Um, yeah, yeah, very true. So I think in future games, if we were to, to play this again, I would uh, take what we've learned here and probably, um, after having lost here, I, I would try to... Uh, develop my game actually more slowly, even though there's an advantage normally to getting the kings out there because of that uh, risk. I would want to trade off pieces probably before um, bringing the kings into the game. Yeah, one of the things that you could do is try and wait until my very valuable pieces are spread out more, uh, whether they're empowered or not, and then put your kings in a position where they are able to execute a successful whirlwind attack and take out a lot of valuable pieces on my end. So. Um, one thing that I've noticed is that it's particularly the pawns that are under high threat from the whirlwind attack since they are not as powerful as any uh, other piece by themselves. So it's, it's very easy to take out a lot of pawns very early on using those uh, whirlwind attacks. So that's one of the things that I, I really watched out for in trying to play, uh, trying to counter that ability to ex actually execute that kind of move. Um, yeah. yeah, you defended your pieces very well. You'll notice that you, you actually have more material in this game. Um, yeah, I, I really took a while. Like The first two games were really about trying to figure out the, the main mechanics of the game. And then once I, I sort of grasped the, the concept of uh, having to watch out for that whirlwind attack and having to watch out for the king coming anywhere near any valuable pieces, then I was able to sort of construct a, a defense that uh, enabled me to play aggressively and pretty much force you into the into the defense. And I, I think I kept you in. The, I kept you retreating for about half the game. Uh, yep. So uh, that seems to be one of the th one of the ways that you can counter this sort of strategy with uh, double king army. Uh, but it does seem like a very well balanced game overall. So I did not have any. Uh, and not at any time, at least, I, I did have any feeling uh, that there was sort of an, an overpowering sense of unbalance to the setup of the abilities of the army. So that's a good thing. Yeah, Sterling is, uh, is he, he adds this kind of asymmetry to a lot of his games, and he writes a lot about um, the subject of balancing asymmetric games. It's a very difficult um, subject to really to get into or to, to attempt, but he... Um, has built up a skill of this over a long period of time so developing an asymmetric game. So if there's anyone to try and, and make a, a asymmetric chess interesting, I think it would be would be Serlin. Yes. Uh, so yeah, um, I think that pretty much concludes our, our small preview of uh, Chess 2 here. Um, the one thing that I, I really noticed is that this is going to be very interesting to see uh, a lot of people play and, and try to sort of develop different approaches towards uh, in trying to get that uh, balance to come out for the different kinds of armies. So I'm very excited to, to, to see what's going to happen with the other kinds of armies and the, the different playstyles that will definitely arise from this. Um, so is there any... I'm also very excited to see sort of the strategies that will come out of the, the community as we uh, play this game together and um, sort of deba debate about uh, the merits of the different positions and whatnot. Um, that's one of the reasons that I built the game in the first place was just to um, have opponents and to... Because um, I didn't do the, the game design, Sterling did, and I approached him to make this client so that, um, so that we would be able to play together. Yes. Uh, so, so pretty much uh, one of the things that I, I like most about uh, games like chess and, and, and now chess too is 
it actually requires player skill and insight instead of offering you different tools to win the game as as quickly as possible. You actually get uh, the the added component of, of player skill and how much insight the player actually can have into future possible moves and then to to see actually what kind of move puts you in what kind of position. So that's very nice to see a sort of. I know it's sort of refreshing to, to play a game that actually requires you to think instead of uh, just doing whatever the, the game tells you to. So, so yeah. Um, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Yeah, I, I did very much enjoy it. So I'm very, very, very excited to see where this game will go. Um, and for those of you watching, I would like to thank you for watching this exclusive preview for Chess 2. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. If you did not, or if you did, please leave something in the comments, uh, because we will be uploading this to YouTube. Um, we always appreciate feedback, of course, if you had any uh, remarks for uh, the way that this video was created, or any remarks for the game, please let us know in the comments. And Zach, I would like you very much to thank you very much for uh, joining us and to give us this chance to enjoy chess too and enjoy where it was going so i would like to thank you very much for this interview and i would like to wish you all the best luck with developing the game all right my pleasure have fun matthias yeah you too see ya